Hello, we are waiting for some people to get into the room. Welcome to the next session of Etapai Type Talks 2022. We are very happy to welcome Elena Ramirez Hello. from Spain, a friend of mine. <laughs> I'm super happy to introduce you. Uh, it's very rare to have uh, this uh, presence of female uh, web designers and programmers. So I'm double proud of this because uh, she's from Spain, she's a woman, and <laughs> she, okay. so everything. So there are a lot of reasons to be proud of uh, having Elena with us today. So Elena, uh, she's a web designer, um, also a developer, and she is a half part of Azure Design, and she will introduce herself in a while. Welcome, Elena. Thank you so much, Laura. Well, uh, I don't know. People is getting in the room, so maybe I can wait or let's go. Let's go, right? Uh, you all see my, my screen right now? Yeah. Perfect. So hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing great, wherever you are right now. And first, I want to say thank you for assisting and attending this um, talk about website setting for the digital world. And I want to say thank you to the ATPI for inviting me to share with you our summarized workflow in four step and some thoughts I have in this field. Um, although Laura made me a great presentation, let me add that I'm the technical creative director and co-founder of Asler. You can find me in, on social networks in Asler, as, as, Asler Design in Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or whatever, and in Twitter as Lena Twitteada. I'm not lately that active, but I'm planning to come back. So if you want to talk about, uh, of course, web, typography, CSS, animation, or whatever, I will super happy. Um, actually, uh, Azure Design is the studio I created about seven years ago with that other half that you see there. Uh, he's actually, well, his name is uh, Octavio Pardo, and he's a type designer. Um, Actually, he's one of the main reasons I'm here today talking about uh, typography because he teach me and he helped me to understand a lot of things about typography in the visual world. He taught me uh, to under or he helped me to understand um, layout. He helped me to understand the teeny tiny details of uh, the glyphs, typography, the secrets actually, and that's something that helped me a lot because one of the things that I do every day is uh, I design user interfaces. But then, on the other hand, uh, I code websites. Um, having these two roles, design and coding, have uh, led me uh, to, to understand better the difference of web typography for designers and for developers, and what are the missing pieces in each area. So I try to talk about the basics a lot, because I think, and you will see in the, at the end of the, of the presentation, that I think it's necessary still um yeah what, what i do and these two roles that i have led me to understand a little bit in a global perspective uh, web typography so one of the projects that has helped me a lot actually with uh, with the coding part and treating typography as a um, as a technical resource and asset has been developing this kind of project that is the digital type foundries we are in the ATPI, so i'm probably sure that all the assistants know what is a, a type foundry, but in case someone is a developer and doesn't know, I don't know. It's the e-commerce for typography. And we have developed uh, uh, subtypos by Alec Paul, um, Type Republic by Andrew Values, Nova Type Foundry by Joanna Correa. Last year, we launched Letter Juice by Pilar Cano and Ferran Milan. And we rec recently launched uh, Forte Type by Fermin Guerrero. We are working actually in hours uh, for the last year, hopefully. And of course, in all these uh, kind of, uh, of uh, projects, we use a lot of typography, but we do it uh, with all the, our projects. And sometimes, actually, we can get more creative and we have projects that make uh, a lot of fun for us because if you want, you can check this in your own devices. This is a project where we have a lot of freedom to, to play with typography. And in this kind of projects, we like to create some effects like this one. Uh, if you enter the page, you will see that every time you refresh the, pa the page, you are going to have a different configuration for the headlines, for the letter of the headlines. So it's like a, quite a unique experience every time you enter the page. The page. 
So with this, let's go now to this summarized uh, workflow we, we have in our studio working with web typography. The first step is, um, of course, selection of typefaces. And this is a, an ans a question we have quite often, is how do we select our typefaces? Um, the problem is there is not, not a raw answer to give to this question because, of course, depends on the project and depends on a lot of crit criterion and you have you can have different um, considerations uh, for every project. But one of the things that we try to, to fit every time is um, trying to transmit and communicate the brand purpose and the brand, um, yeah, uh, the brand uh, values, okay? So uh, that's the main thing you need to do. It could be maybe with a temporary criterion or maybe with a morphologic or maybe with a concept. I'm going to show you right now like um, a project. This is a work in progress project that we have in the studio right now. Um, it's for a company called Optimus Crane. They are a consultancy engineering for companies that need help building big uh, infrastructure with cranes. Um, they made this super bold and super brave movement of uh, calling themselves Optimus Crane, that it's a reference to a transformer name, Optimus Prime. Um, actually, they even wanted to, to include this symbol with um, the robotish ball. So for this project, we were super sure that we wanted to follow this brave movement and create something quite... Um, quite uh, 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 I don't know how to say this, uh, uh, like a different um, with uh, brave and bold uh, shapes. Um, actually, we create this that is quite technological. You can see the, the um, square shapes we have in the, in the uh, shapes, in the letters. But then you can see that the, the tape is being uh, created like if been like a little pieces of Lego that fit together, that get assembled. Uh, that it's like a, actually a assembled and uh, folded and unfolded, even twisted. And that's the feeling we wanted to give to our uh, brand, brand name. And then we thought that this could work super good as a display typeface for our uh, applications, even the web and the big titles we have uh, there. So we created this uh, limited set with the uppercase, some numbers, some punctuation, and that's it's going to be our main font for big uh, hero text. But then, of course, this is not going to work for, for a small sizes, body copy. So for that, what we wanted is to search and select a font that will make a contrast, like super in a natural uh, way, that's something that it, it will be subtle. And for that, we choose approach by N-Type, Eduardo Manso. Um, and actually it's super elegant, it's super regular. So it's something that fits super good and make a good contrast with the display text I showed you before. Uh, we have now the, the display text and then the, um, the body text, but we wanted something in the middle. Um, actually N-Type has another one that it fits and it make a good connection in this project and between the two of, uh, of I showed you before. Um, it, this is Centos. I end up again. And actually, when you see the three all together, they made this like writing concept from this is super um, constructed, quite Lego typeface, something that is more in the middle and then something that is more subtle. So, but again, this is something that has been working for us um, right now with this project. This is uh, just a mock-up uh, of how we look in the, in the web uh, site. It's, still in progress as i said before but um beside that it's something that you can see works super good with headlines uh but then the secondary you can see it here syntax and then in the tiny details you can see approach okay but uh, i was saying that game it, this is something that only works in this project so everybody has its own needs the the thing you need to to fit with every project is that that uh, you need to think what you want to transmit with, with your typeface and then uh, search for that in, in, in your phones. 
So let's go to the second step. We try to care, take care in our de web development is, uh, and I know Jason was talking about this just today, um, is you send a, a little bit of, it's going to be shorter for sure, and uh, this explanation. We try to use type scales in our design system. Uh, actually, for me, type scales are mini design si system with uh, several harmonious type sizes based on a factor, on a ratio, uh, that bring orders and consistency to our design and that can be escalated. I mean, we, we have all the steps that we want to include. And this ratio could be any number, of course, but actually there are some of them that uh, are related to mathematics, that are related to music, and they get super good results for, for the type of scale. Like the one you can see on the right, I think you can see on the right. Yeah, it's not mirror again. So I hope it's not mirror. Um, so yeah, but what is the best type of scale I can use for my website? Of course, again, it depends on the website you're, you're creating. There is an amazing article by Elliot Dahl. It's, it has four years now, this article, but it's a still super good, uh, super good reading. I recommend it. And in this article, uh, Elliot talked about make a, a three category for, for websites. And he said that we have marketing sites, that it's uh, the, the sites where we try to catch the user attention super fast. So we probably are, we are going to use contrast, uh, maybe with color, but probably with sizes. And we're going to have super big uh, headlines with um, regular text, uh, body text copy. And then, then we can have a blog info site that here, maybe we will have some big headlines, but not that big at the marketing site. And then we have the product side where the data of the user is going to be the more important thing to show. So we don't, we need that the typography be more subtle. And depending on what kind of a project you're creating, you can use if you're creating a marketing site, the biggest, um, the biggest number of the, of the type of scales. If you are creating like a block info, probably it will, it will be better if you use the medium sizes. And for the, um, Product sites, it's better if the number for the ratio is small, because in that case, you will have a better size steps between uh, each other. And you can create this type of scales, of course, with uh, several online tools, modular scale, type of scale. They are quite old right now. I mean, I think for, for sure, like 15 years out, but I mean, they're useful today and I am still using some time. But what we do right now is we create the type scale in our design process. So we use a Figma, we can use some uh, plugins like type scale or font scale. And what we do is we decide what of the type scale we want to use and we create the steps. That's it, we create the step. Usually we try with several type scales options and then we decide for one. And then what we do is we relate each one of the steps to our different text element in our design, okay? And we relate it with two sizes. We do this because as um, Jason talked yesterday and there is another talk about, uh, talking about this, um, we use responsive typography. So we need to have a small size for uh, screen devices like a mobile and a big size for <clears throat> big screen um, desktop, okay? So we create all of this in our um, in our design file, and then we will go to the coding part. This is our third step. We go to coding, and we will talk about units and accessibility. So for getting our scale into code, what we use is the CSS function clamp. Again, if you has been talk uh, uh, during this uh, text talks um, several times. And with this, uh, with this uh, CSS function, what we have and what we say is, okay, our element is going to be this size in the small, uh, small devices. It's going to be this minimum size. Then it's going to be the minimum and some growing factor. I will explain later why we use the minimum in the middle. And then we have the maximum size for our element. Okay, and this actually, this, this rule, this CSS rule is something that we have in all our text element in our code. And with that code, 
and some boilerplate we have in, in boilerplate file we reuse every time in our projects where we have some uh, type scales available predefined and some scale step available too. What we need to do in every project is just saying the scale we want and the minimum and maximum um, sizes for each element. So just the right part is the, the part we need to create for every project. The left part and this code before has been reused from project to project. It's like uh, making quite easy the connection between design and coding part. And I'm talking a lot about uh, um, font sizes. Um, I be before I continue, I would like to talk about units and accessibility, because for me, the main point here is that designers and developers should use different units for web type setting. Because when you are a designer and you use uh, this kind of programs, a Figma, Figma, Sketch, Adobe, you are working with pixels. I mean, I'm working with pixels when uh, when I work with these programs. Um, even if they are not uh, putting their the pixel unit reference, they are like um, they are pixels. The problem is that pixel is what we call an absolute unit, and it's not a good unit for for setting font sizes, okay? Because they are related to the physical world, to the physical measure. We can have centimeters in CSS, we could use it, but it's not, for a screen, it's not the, the right unit to use. It could be good if we are creating a CSS for, for printing, for example, it will be amazing, but not in this case. For a screen, we have what we call relative units. And these relative units are related to another lens that can be the font, and here we have the, the the unit M, that is the font size of the of the font, the of the element, the typeface. We have the X unit that is relative to the X height of the element. Then we have the CH. This uh, unit is super useful. Uh, well, it's based on the zero width glyph, and it's super useful for limiting the line length of uh, our paragraphs or our text. And REM is super super it's quite uh, similar to m and then we have the relative units relative to the viewport okay and this is actually what we use for creating the the responsive type in our websites they are super useful too but it has some limitation that i show you now so what is the best choice for a uh, font type setting the right choice is to be m or rem and actually, they are converted by the browser to 16 pixels. Um, if you are wondering right now, uh, like, OK, what is the point of using relative units M or M if the, brow if the browser is going to convert it to, to pixels? What is the point of not using pixels from the beginning? Well, the reason is that if we use pixels, we're uh, going to mess with accessibility. Uh, um, let me show you this quick sample I created. Um, you can see here that there are two um, two blocks of text. They look exactly the same. The only difference that they have is that left one is created with pixels, and the right one is created with relative units. In this case, uh, right. And at first sight, as I said, exactly the same. If we use the zoom, they behave exactly the same too. But there is another functionality, um, another feature in in the browser that allows users to change the default font size of, uh, of the browser. So I told you before that uh, one M and one rem is 16 pixel, but that this is something we can change in, in our browser for, for, for accessibility uses. And this is something that uh, is super good for, for, for um, people with impairment, visual impairments, but uh, when I say something like this, it sounds like it's for people that has a, a permanent impair, but all of us could have some temporary impair. So this is for all of us, okay? So accessibility is not something for disability people, it's not for all of us. So what's the point of using Pixel? If I change this configuration, I, I come back to our sample, the, the text set with Pixel hasn't changed. It has remained with the same configuration as before. So we have prevented that the people with the special needs, temporary or permanent, can change and adjust the test 
to to their configuration because that's what happened with the rem uh, actually uh, with the rem typography set as you can see has grown based on the new typography default size okay so this is the main reason we shouldn't use uh, pixels in our web uh, type typefaces at least for font sizing okay uh, now uh, yeah and I showed you before the CSS scan function and I told you we were in the middle using the growing factor plus the minimum size. Um, we, we do this because the, the problem is that if we don't do this and use only the view per unit, we are messing again with accessibility because of course the user can change the default size, but the screen is going to be always the same size. So we need to always add a relative unit based on the font size to the viewport um, size, okay? And then the last part, one of my favorites, is uh, we always try in our uh, in our development, trying to take care of the performance of the website, okay? For those of you that never heard about the performance, is the defined by the Mozilla Developer Network Group like uh, the objective measurement and perceived user experience of a website. You can say is that uh, how a website is uh, is loaded, how fast is loaded a website, okay? And this is super important because there are several studies that uh, claim that uh, the long your website it takes to load, the more users you, you are going to, uh, to lose. And they say that for more than four seconds, that actually is, not that much one two three four you could lose uh, you could lose like 60 percent of the, your users and of course you're creating a website for your users so this is something well, for getting users you, this is something you need to take care of and actually it's that important that more than a year uh, before ago um google uh, launched the core web vitals this is a new set of metrics that Google used to ranking the web pages. So pages with a bad performance is going to is going to um, uh, be lower in the results. Okay, um, there are more metrics, but the two that I think it will affect uh, um, if we use web font are these two: the LCP, that is that the largest contentful pane, and it's. Uh, the main content that is going to be loaded when we enter a website could be the, an image, but it could be uh, a text and a slogan or whatever. And then the CLS, that is the cumulative layout shift. And super sure um, this happens to you, for sure, at least once, that you are entering a, a web page. You are about to click or tap on some link and then an image appears from the top and everything is rearranged and you end up clicking in another place you don't want. Okay. So I explain what is the performance. I explain uh, why it's important, but how web fonts affect the performance. This is a super simplified uh, image to explain the process. But uh, when a user enter um, a website, what we at uh, the server um, give us is an HTML file that has all the content, textual content, but then it has to the linked files and these files could be, for example, the CSS. The CSS is, is where we put our colors, typefaces, layout, everything. And in this file, actually, is the reference for our web fonts, usually. And the browser are actually quite small. Uh, so they don't start to download the, the web fonts until they are sure that some of the contents are using it. So since a user try to get uh, our website until we have the, the web phone ready. We have a time of waiting here that of course is not fixed. It depends on a lot of things. It's like uh, the speed connection of the server, the data connection of the user, the phone si file, the phone size of our files and so on. So the problem is that we have this waiting time here and what is happening in our website during, those during this time? Well, it could be happening two things. It could be happening that we don't show anything of our text until I have my web phone. And that's what we call FOID, flash of, of invisible text. Um, what it could be happening is like, okay, I have a, 
and we have fonts in our devices, mobile, desktop, or whatever. So I can show a fallback font and then switching when I have my, my web font. If this is what we call fault plus of fun style text. Okay, so we can do both of these things, but we are um, uh, impacting the performance in this uh, way because if we do void, that is not recommended at all, we are hiding our main content, so we are hitting the performance. But then with the switching, uh, showing the fallback and switching to the, the our web phone when we are ready, we are creating a little bit of cumulative layout shift, but it's better. Actually, for user um, user experience, it's better, this option. So always try to, to show the fallback from. And I told you before that we need to wait until the, the um, CSS, the browser analyzes the CSS and we, we have our files. But actually, there are several things that we can do to improve a little bit the performance. The first one, or one of them, is we can preload our files. We can say to the browser, OK, come on, guy, trust me. I'm going to need these files, so don't wait until you have the CSS. I'm going to need it. Start loading after the um, you start with the HTML file. So we can use the preload, say what is the, the file we want to preload, and we will have a little improvement in our performance. And then another thing that we'll be able to do in the future, I'm super excited with this CSS property, but sadly it's not available in all the browsers, it's just available in Firefox, is this property called size at use. And with this property, we will be able to equalize all the X height of the um, of our fonts, fallback and web font that we are going to use. So the color and the texture of the text box is going to be pretty similar. So the switching jump is going to be smaller. So I'm crossing my fingers to get this uh, soon enough in in uh, the browsers, and we will be doing the, we will be able to do it in the future. And finally, this is actually more than a request, actually, to type designers and type foundries. Uh, another thing that we can do, actually, is subsetting and trying to improve our files. Uh, because uh, we uh, trying to, to get a good performance, we do a lot of things as developers. We um, optimize our, to our images, our videos, we minify our text documents as CSS, JavaScript, or whatever. We do a lot of things, but actually, uh, with a lot of uh, foundries or with a lot of license, we cannot make any change in our web form files. And actually, maybe for our projects, I don't need all the uh, script languages, system languages. I don't need all the open type features that are amazing, but maybe I don't need it in, me, in my projects. So it will be amazing and it will be uh, it's something we can do right now we could subset our phone and create a smaller phone file to using our websites okay so it live here the request will be amazing too and finally a last thought actually the workflow is ready and but i have a, a thought this is a heat map that uh, we employ in, uh, in user experience and actually what it represents is the maximum that people don't read online. And that's, you can see there, the, the red spot is the where people fix it the, on the site. And it's uh, okay at the beginning of the, the sentences uh, and okay at the beginning of the paragraphs, but then we lose a little bit of the interest. And I know this is part of the medium for sure. We are in the medium that is quick and is fast. But then lately, I'm wondering a little bit if we have a, a little of a blame here, you can say. And I wanted to show you the this. This is the state of CSS from the last year, 2021. And it has a complete section uh, for typography. And when I saw the result, I was a little bit devastated because they weren't so good. Um, it's so sad because there is a lot of people talking about typography and web, and I learned a lot uh, of you. Um, the problem is that the results are not good because let me make a quick uh, resume. Font variant CSS property is the, the property to getting access to the OpenType features. 
And last year, at least 52% uh, of the developers said that never heard about this property. So they are not going to use OpenType features at all. 27% uh, uh, they know it, but never use it. So that let us only 20% of the developers using OpenType features in our uh, websites. The same for initial letters. This property is uh, for getting this ornament first letter in some paragraphs. And here 40% and 35% of the developers never heard about it or never use it. Form variant numeric, and this is quite uh, painful because we have a lot of uh, tabular data online. We have tables. Um, we have a lot to, to use this. This is the property, by the way, for using tabular numbers, all the style numbers, uh, proportional numbers, whatever. All the open type features uh, related with the, with numbers and 70% of the developers never heard about it. That's like a lot of developers. Font display is a little bit better. And I think it's because it's more technical property. It's not something so much related with the typography world. It's not uh, more technical, but still 44%. Line clap for creating text ellipses, almost 50%, and then variable fonts that we've been talking, I think it was four or five years ago, first time that in the IT power we talk about typography, not me, but I mean, uh, we talk here, and 40% of the developers never heard about what is a, a variable font. It could be a little bit different for sure right now, because now it's getting the 22 uh, GR survey, but but I'm super sure it's not going to be that different. And I'm talking here about um, um, developers all the time, but I don't think they are the one to blame completely. I think this is something that it needs to come from the design team sometimes, uh, because as a developer, I maybe don't think about uh, getting the tabular numbers. But if the design team told me, okay, we have this table, we have this number with these ciphers, and we need to show you in the best possible way, please activate open type the features. So we need more communication between, and that's what we like to, to do. And this is the reason that I keep talking about the basics, because these results are not so good for me, at least. So this is the reason I think we should keep talking about the difference in the web typography world for designers and for developers and get a um, point, sweet point in the middle. Okay, so that's it. Any question? I don't know if there's a question. Okay. Should I check? That was so great. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank yeah, you. thank you. I mean, I have seen it. Uh, it's not the first time I see this talk. I yes. must confess. It's not the first time. <laughs> but I'm amazed by uh, your uh, knowledge, of course, big, break, big admiration, and also how you are just really going to the point, you know? Like it's very didactic, uh, really going point by point, super well structured presentation. and and making us uh, type designers learning more about the needs of web type and that are a lot <laughs> you know also great resources for students and for teachers i would yeah. say that's super nice yeah i the the what you uh, what you were showing for um how you set it up in in code to be able to create those scales so quickly uh it was absolutely fascinating i, I mean i think that's really wonderful nice. um, <laughs> yeah, for just um so similar to what i was talking about yesterday with the design system stuff i mean what you know for everybody else here what elena showed um it is such a perfect way to plug into that to set up that scale and and then you know be able to make small adjustments when yeah. you change the the typeface um it makes it so much more flexible in in the design system and you know or as a starting point because i think that uh, I'm, I'm betting that you use this on multiple projects and i think a lot of designers and developers um, miss out on an opportunity to create their own starter kit and and that you know it gets you so much further so much faster um, to work with things like that i'm uh what i'd love to ask you um about is 
what your thoughts are on, uh, we know that developers uh, aren't as familiar with a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. um, my suspicion is that uh, they're not familiar with those things because no one's asked them before. Yeah. And, and so I, I you know, in, in my mind, I, I, I have been, I've been talking to developers for 10 years about this and clearly it's not having that big an impact, mm -hmm. but you know, I think, um, I, I love, like, what are your thoughts about how, uh, how we could go about designing, uh, I'm sorry, uh, educating designers about these features, um, yeah, I, when there's I, a disconnect between graphic design and UI design. I think that's kind of our biggest problem. Yes, and I think actually when uh, when we teach uh, UI design, we keep just thinking about the visual part that, of course, is super important. But then we have some rules in our medium that is uh, the digital medium, and, and actually, it's different from website to apps or whatever. It has different uh, um, settings and whatever. So for me. If you want to teach uh, web design, you need to know a little bit of, about CSS. That's something that you need to, or at least speak with someone who knows about CSS and can tell you like, okay, this is uh, something we can do. This is something we cannot do. This is something that we will be able to do in the future. So it's hard for me to give you an answer that this is the, probably the, the way to do it for sure. I'm not, uh, I don't have that answer, but for me, it's like, uh, we need to talk more because of course we designers doesn't know about CSS property, but this CSS properties give us the opportunity to make better web type setting. So they need to know somehow that that is available. So I don't know, we need, maybe we need to create an, um, right in the middle role profile that it's like, okay, I'm going to tell you to this part, uh, to the designers, the, no, the things that you know you don't know, and then to the developers, the things that you, you don't know. Because I remember first time I gave the uh, uh, talk, I talk about the open type features, and I remember a colleague um, and a super recognized uh, developer asking me, but that's inside the typefaces I'm using? It's like, yes. That's not something you need to load uh, in another file. It's, no, it's in the file you're using. And she was like, wow, why no one told me about this? Um, yeah, I think the point is we need to keep, for sure, keeping keep talking about this in different rooms, the design rooms and the developer rooms. Um, let's keep trying. Mm. <laughs> always, always. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, w one thing that I, I think is uh, certainly positive uh, is there's just more being written and more attention being paid to uh, to type. And and I, I that's um, so you mentioned font display swap. Um, well, you mentioned font display in, yes. in that. Um, and and that's like that's at least one thing that has gotten a lot of attention of developers in terms of how that um, impacts the way, uh, text gets rendered and how quickly it goes, uh, yes. to the fallback font and, and whatnot. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, when we can relate as far as like talking to developers, when you can relate things to challenges that they have, um, I'm, I'm betting that that gets people's attention a lot more, um, like tabular numbers for interface design. Like that's um, like that's that's one that I, I would imagine that uh, is probably an easy one to convince developers to care about. Um, yes. but just but, letting you set numbers well and uh, inside other elements and stuff. But then I have some friends, some developer friends, that uh, when they started to listen this and and they understand, okay, this kind of numbers is for tabular data. They are using it all the time. For me, the the Problem is that a type design is um, not type design, web typography. It's something like a small group of people is taking care of, but uh, there is a lot of developers that could learn about this. And actually it's not that, uh, I mean, it's not that difficult. It's just they're 
taking care about, as you said, another things and other technical parts. And this is something visual, so they don't think it's part of their job. So, but then when they know, it's like with this just tiny CSS code, you can do this. It's like, okay, I like this. This is super interesting. So yeah, it's just it's talking um, to them again and again. Uh, yeah. I guess there is no oh. any question. I, I say everything super clear, right? Come on, <laughs> ask question. <laughs> well, I'm feeling brave today. Um, oh, here's a, actually, this is a great, uh, a great question, you know, in terms of um, subsetting. So let's, um, let's assume that you have gotten permission from the type designer or the vendor that, to subset the, mm -hmm. the font. I mean, that's a whole other question for us to ask. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of uh, your choice about subsetting, what is, um, what's what do you typically go to in terms of like a character set to to subset to and um, and how big a difference does that make in your in your experience actually it makes a lot i mean it could make a lot because of course as i i told before it's like a, a good typeface it has a support for several uh, languages and it has a lot of open type features but then somehow imagine uh, i showed you at the beginning the project for uh, l'atelier uh, and L'Atelier is a small bakery in Pamplona that only sells to Pamplona because uh, you, you need to go to the physical store to, to pick the, the order. So I'm super sure in that, uh, in that um, project that I'm, I'm not going to use Cyrillic or I'm not going to use uh, a lot of uh, open side features or maybe arrows or maybe... So the point is first, of course, uh, trying to see what you are going to use in your project. Probably don't go too far cutting and getting everything else. Like, okay, I'm not going to use the, um, I don't know, the, um, the slash bar. Maybe you will do in the future, so don't go too far. But you you have a super good, I only do this with the, um, the phone files that I know I have permission maybe for the for the um, for, uh, foundries or for our own typefaces, the impact in the file uh, size is quite big. You could have a, like, a, I don't know, 80% of the um, reduced. Again, it depends on the project of what you're doing, but you can have a, a significant amount of a decrease uh, in the phone file. And that's super good. Um, as I said, we optimize everything, every, or we try to optimize everything. Um, so why don't do the same with, uh, and I must, I, I can understand somehow because maybe you are getting the subset and you're getting out the ligatures or maybe you're getting out something that is important. I can understand the concern of the type designers, but maybe we can, we can talk and we can get some point in the middle. Um, um, take us on some sweet decision for all of us. You know, an interesting thing, uh, technique that I saw somebody use um, was to uh, subset the font and um, have one that has just sort of a bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And then actually, uh, so uh, for those who haven't written a lot of, of CSS, when you specify the font family, you can specify a list. Yes. And, and if it, when it I renders might. the page, it, yeah, so it'll show everything with what it has in that first font. And if it doesn't, then it's going to substitute even just one glyph um, in whatever that next fallback is. And uh, Lawrence uh, and Irene, uh, with their faux foundry effort, I know I had a presentation about this uh, last year, or the year before, I think. Um, about dynamically sort of fixing this idea for Greek character sets. But you yes. could do that for anything. You could create another font that just has the stuff that you stripped out that you don't often use and list that one second, and it will then only load when it needs it. Uh, so it might be only a few bytes uh, that you could load to get that those extra character sets. For sure, because as I told before, the, the browsers are smart and say, okay, I, I'm not going to download this phone until I'm sure 
we are using in some text. So that's a super good uh, um, type uh, or, or workflow for working with this kind of things. And actually, we know this, this, there is this dynamic subsetting that Google was trying to do because, of course, the, the Latin is OK. It's uh, hidden in the performance, but it's OK. But with the uh, uh, Chinese or uh, Undi or the Vanagaris, sorry, or it's, it's a more important thing to, to take care of. So yeah, yeah, that's something that um, it could be done. And actually, I, I'm, I because I, I use it sometimes, there are some foundries that when you buy a um, uh, style, a phone style, they give you three sizes, sizes. So you have the small, the medium, and the large. And they made this subsetting for you. And it's quite nice. It's a, it's a, a good option, but then, is something that is not for your product, product, project. And as I said, all, all the time is every project has their own needs. So it would be better if right. we have this uh, option available. Elena, yeah, we have, oh, sorry. We have oh, a question. Oh, oh. We have a question okay. at, the, at the questions hey. uh, chat. We should do it now, I think. It's okay, Jason? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just, um, I wanted to point to Pablo's comment just related to what Elena was just mentioning um, about progressive font, uh, what's well, called pro progressive font downloading now. Yes. Um, and that's actually will, that's something that's coming. Um, the W3C has been working on that. I've been actually part of that process uh, for the last few years to develop that standard to allow fonts to be streamed effectively and patched from one page view to the next. And that actually will make a lot of these problems just totally go away. Yes. Uh, but check that out from uh, from from Pablo in the chat. And then we yeah. should talk about Christian's uh, question. Yeah. That, that, that's yeah. nice uh, news because it's something amazing. Yeah. Sorry. Christian, Elena, Christian Cruz is asking this. In the survey, it showed a growing percentage of users not knowing or willing to use basic type alternate tape alternate features. I wonder about the relation to variable phones and how they will thrive on the web with this scenario. Sorry, because I don't understand well. Can you read the Q&A? Yes, I can. Well, I, now I have, I mean, I can read it. Okay, I wonder about the relation to variable phones. Sorry, Christian, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> Do you understand? I, I, um, well, uh, we 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 could always let let we could always let Christian actually bring yeah. it up himself and actually exactly. we could Christian we could talk can. to you about it if you if you want to, Christian. Yeah, sure, please. It's, it's more in the sense of uh, when you're talking about even like how to save space with subsetting, as you said, like uh, dropping off some basic characters because people are basically not using them. And then let's say when you go for variable fonts, you kind of exponentially uh, like enlarge the size of the file by having all those kind of extra characters that you don't need as well. So I, I wonder for the sake of the technical issues that, are, that goes along with that, if if actually web designers are going to eventually not use variable fonts at all, what's become like a huge problem, like in, enlarging the problem instead of solving. Uh, now I understand perfectly, and <laughs> thank you for the explanation. Super, I mean, super smart question. And actually, that's one of the reasons for me, variable fonts is um, getting a little bit of struggle because every time we explain variable fonts, it's like, okay, this is going to be, uh, this is going to reduce the file size, but maybe it's not true because if your variable font has a lot of axes, and you're going to, uh, you're going only to use one of them, why do you want the rest? So for me, variable phone, it, it has this uh, handicap a little bit because they're amazing. They can do a lot of things, but then we should take care about, or we, we should check the configuration we need in the, our projects because actually some developers are super uh, into not using any web phones actually because they hurt the performance, they impact the performance. So if the variable phone is going to be larger than the single file, even if they have some uh, some improvements, they have some advantages, 
it's going to be difficult. It could be, be, be difficult. Um, for me, it will be amazing to have a tool to split those access to and get only what we need because we need it and they are amazing. And for creating animation, it's like sweet. But then we need to take care about the file size for sure. Because even in my example, sometimes it's like, OK, I'm going to prepare this. I'm going to show how this variable phone is feel, um, small, smaller than the two sizes. And it's, oh, it's almost the same. It's not exactly. It's like, and it's like um, something that we will, we should take care and check in the future to see how they handle in the web developer part. Yeah, but I think that's the, uh, there's a gap between developers and type designers in that sense. So, one, because mostly I've seen lately more variable fonts being used to promote uh, like uh, alternate, uh, like uh, uh, variations on the style, could be even the A and G and other kind of basic alternates that I used to have and it was not accessible uh, in general, apart from using InDesign or other softwares for graphic design. But the thing is now, if they show up these features in variable fonts, but it actually makes, uh, it harms the performance. So I'm wondering if uh, all those fonts are actually trying to sell it as a way to make it easier. It makes it actually easier for some people, but not actually if you're using on the web. I think there are a lot of projects that will be um, better with variable fonts, but uh, maybe we need to take care of uh, the rest and, and just check if they are uh, the right projects for variable fonts. And you said that there's a lot of developers and it's true, but there are a lot of designers that don't know about uh, the variable fonts. A lot. We, we know a lot of the designers that it's variable font. What is that? And it's like, well, uh, and that's the, for me, as I told before, that's the first step. I mean, they need to use variable fonts if we should include it in our websites. And that's something that needs to come from, from the first step in the process. So then probably we will fight because they wanted the variable phone and then we'll see like, okay, one megabyte is like, no, we cannot load one megabyte of phones because that's actually something that we shouldn't do. And I hope as there are some tools uh, for creating um, group setting to non variable phones, I think there are other tools and it will create another tools to, to actually for the AP, uh, API of Google is super good for this, I think. Mm -hmm. Because they let uh, what part of the axis you want um, from this range, I mean, this range from this uh, number to this number. They have made it a super good uh, work with the, the with the API for the Google Fonts um, actually, and I think they cover pretty good. But that's something we need to the rest of the web fonts. Uh, that's a tool we need to include for our small type foundries and um, the rest of the web world web type. Yeah, that's that's definitely that's. Uh, somebody else had, had been asking, uh, I think it was, uh, Guillaume was asking about this in the, in the chat, um, about how Adobe's handling font mm -hmm. subsetting. And the truth is Adobe and Monotype and Google have all come up with their own solutions for that to handle it dynamically. And, and that's why we needed a standard. And, and really once that comes about, then the need to subset by axis or, or anything else sort of goes away because it will only download the, the glyphs that it needs to render the page that you're looking at, regardless of what the source file is. So um, that's that's an interesting future. We're not really quite quite there yet, but um, but it is it is really interesting that that Google, uh, the Google Fonts team has really figured out a great solution for splitting out axes, giving a subset of that range and, and all of those things. Um, but, uh, you know, that's it's not as um, easy to discover in the Google Fonts interface. Um, so designers who are using the Google Fonts interface aren't necessarily seeing what they can do. Um, and so again, like, we have this disconnect of designers need to know that it's there so they can play around with it and, and see what they can do. Um, and then developers can then use the API or, or other, other tools to do it. Um, but then, 
you know, if it's one that you want to self-host unless it's open source, then um, you run into licensing and, and permissions, you know, in, in order to be able to subset things legally um, and ethically, uh, you know, so that's, um, that's a challenge too. But um, I, that's probably worth noting that uh, for all of us who are designers and developers, um, the first thing you ought to do is contact the type designer and ask. Uh, because more, more often than not, um, I, they will be more than happy to help either provide a subset or if you can show them that you're doing it responsibly, then uh, I've had others that are, are willing to let me go about it and use font tools or something and create exactly the subset that we, um, that we need. Yes. Um, ooh, Slice, interesting. Yeah. I was asking if you know about Slice. It says that it's an no. open source and Slice allows you to design to slice the the, the designer space. It says this is still uh, not the ideal, but there, and he put there. He has the he wrote down the, the link in the chat. Can you see okay. it, Lena? Yeah. No, no. I I was in the other the question. Um, okay. <laughs> now I'm reading this. Yeah. Well, uh, I know that we're we're starting to run low on time. Yes. Um, anybody have <laughs> any other questions that you want? I mean, uh, clearly we could be happy sitting here chatting about this all day long. Elena, this has been a joy. Thank you. Interesting. Actually, if you want to talk in the future, yes, uh, as I told you before, contact me in social media. I'm mm -hmm. kind of a geek now with... Uh, so I will be super happy. <laughs> we should do a seminar well, devoted to this, to to clients, web developers, site designers. For you know, I think it would be very nice if we narrow mm -hmm. things because this is so big and so actually necessary and actual because everything is going on screens. And you know, so we, I think we could uh, we take note about this and we could uh, think about organizing a specific uh, seminar about that. It could be quite nice. Mm -hmm. Or eventually in, in our future ATI Paris, we could uh, take a slice <laughs> of the program and, I, and, and know, put this there. What what I love about that idea is actually if we start this whole process with the type designers themselves and talk to them about what's possible on the web. You know, I mean, I think a lot of type designers don't even necessarily know how much typesetting we can do, but I, I think it's a wonderful idea to actually start at that end of the process with type designers and, and type users, um, and then let it sort of flow and, and look at ways that we could just create more discoverable ways for people to know what they can do with, yeah. with the typeface. Yeah, absolutely. So oh, really, really great presentation. Thank you, Elena. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> the type designer <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh, we can we can always this also, also the hangout group as you know i mean people can keep, keep on the conversation there normally we recommend you elena to go there in case that uh, any questions are not solved but in this case uh, everything is answered <laughs> so you can go to the chat room anytime as you, if you want just to to meet other people Perfect. Oh. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.